shocked um, from that perspective. Um, just to let you know, I went to Kenya uh, 17 years ago now, um, my 40th birthday, so you can do the math and figure out how old I am now. Uh, it was a dream trip of mine. Um, my grandfather was there during World War II, and I grew up sort of on stories that he told about being in East Africa, um, and particularly Kenya, and he'd gone back uh, in the 70s on safari and, and, uh, and the 80s and 90s, and so it was definitely the place I wanted to go. I had not traveled before then, really. Been to Europe, but that was about it. Um, and um, I went, planned a uh, two week safari to Kenya um, and fell absolutely in love with it. I was a vice president of an ad agency in Toronto. Um, I came home and quit my job six weeks later, um, packed my bags. Um, and that was at the point where I made the decision to travel around the world for six months. I, I really thought I was just gonna take sabbatical but I wanted to go back to Kenya and explore more of Africa. Um, and it was definitely Kenya for me that captured my soul. Um, and funnily enough, the company I now work um, for, Bush and Beyond, I stayed at their camps and lodges as a client first um, and for the first two years of my traveling. And it was one of the owners who asked me to actually start doing their sales and marketing. So I always say that's kind of how I started. Um, I actually got married there. Um, so my husband is also a Canadian, um, but I met him um, online in the, in the internet dating world. Uh, and uh, when we got married, we decided we were legally married here, but then took my stepsons and uh, my husband and we had a Samburu um, wedding ceremony. So um, you're seeing me there in, in actually my wedding dress that I wore in Toronto, but in Samburu culture, um, the women wear these ceremonial necklaces. So the necklace that I'm wearing there, that sort of brown necklace is, is made out of elephant hair and giraffe hair and it's handed down generation after generation. So the woman you're seeing, I guess it's gonna be on your left um, is my Samburu mother. So um, I laughed for Ian, my husband, because my mother's deceased and, and he was, I said, you didn't get a mother-in-law except you actually got a Samburu mother-in-law. So, uh, and in their culture, he had to buy my mother a pregnant sheep when we got married. That was a fun exchange for my husband to do. Um, I, and that's Ian and I, we were in Kenya. As soon as Kenya opened up, it opened up August 1st to international travelers. We headed over. Um, uh, so I was over in the fall as well. And, and that's us in front of uh, Mount Kenya, which is, um, Africa's second tallest mountain. So Kilimanjaro is, is the tallest, which is in Tanzania. Interesting story uh, and about weddings and, and coming out of that. Um, Kilimanjaro used to be actually inside the border of Kenya. Um, but when Queen Victoria got married to uh, Prince Albert or King Albert, as he became, um, her wedding gift to him, and he was of German descent, was she gave him Germany, Kilimanjaro. So they changed the border of Tanzania, which was a German protectorate, um, and Kenya, which was a British protectorate, and Kilimanjaro went down and became part of Tanzania. So it was Kenya's first. Um, and uh, so, uh, as I said, I was there in September, October, and then we just came back um, from being there um, for three weeks. Just a little orientation about where Kenya is, because um, that's what we're going to talk about and where we're going to go on safari tonight. Um, Kenya's in East Africa. So um, its borders at the north are going to be Ethiopia and the Sudan. And then on its west is Uganda with Lake Victoria. To the south, you're going to have Tanzania. And then um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, and then on the east, you're going to have the Indian Ocean. Um, so it's actually a coastal uh, country as well. Beautiful beaches, so you can combine safari and beach if you want. I'm going to focus in on, on safaris. Um, the things I love about Kenya and why I think it makes such a great safari destination, and that's not to take away from anywhere else in, in the continent, but what I love about it is a couple things. One, the equator goes right smack dab to the middle of Kenya. That's the equator running right there. So you have the Southern hemisphere and the Northern hemisphere and that gives you a couple things. First of all, it's a temperate climate. So it's a lovely climate. I kind of say it was probably Colorado in September. Um, so you have cool mornings, cool nights, but warm days. Um, the other thing about having the equator run through the middle is you have very different wildlife and topography in the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere, different species of animals, different tribal cultures. 
um, and very different topography. You go from the grasslands of what you picture the Maasai Mara, where we're going to start our safari, and then you move up to the mountains and the highlands um, of Nanuki and Mount Kenya, and then you go up to a very sort of arid place as we get further north, and we're going to finish up in that area. So um, lots of different topography in a very small country. The other thing I love about Kenya is, of course, um, it is still a member of the British Commonwealth. So that means English is the language of business. So you'll feel very comfortable there. Um, you'll recognize the food on, on safari in, in Kenya. Um, again, a lot of very traditional British, so full cooked breakfasts and, and we always have tea in the afternoons and, and uh, um, so you never have to worry about it from a food perspective. I always say I have to diet before I go on safari. So um, what I decided we do um, tonight is we'd actually just do an actual itinerary. So um, this is kind of sort of what um, I was talking to Deb and Debbie about as far as sort of which itinerary could we do because we do have a number of different um, properties, camps and lodges and, and we decided to just pick one that's kind of a great starter and, and gives you a feel of what it would like to be on safari. So all points of entry into Kenya is Nairobi which is a huge major city. I mean, it is like Denver. It's, it's over 4 million people um, in the capital city of Nairobi. But what's fantastic about Nairobi is it actually has a national park on its doorstep. It is the only major metropolitan city in the world that has a wildlife park right there. And when I say park, it is only fenced on the city side. The rest of it, the animals move the way they would. And when I talk about animals, when we were heading to the airport on two weeks ago on our drive to the airport out of the Amakoko, which is based inside the National Park, we drove past a lioness with the planes going above her. I mean, you could see, you know, it's, it's quite an amazing place to start. So um, that's one of the reasons why we, we love starting at the Amakoko because we always say you're going to start your safari as you mean to go on. So we'll pick you up off that international flight. So you've just landed, you've had a great flight over and we put you in our vehicle and you're just gonna get right into our Land Rover and we're gonna drive. It's only seven kilometers in and you will be seeing wildlife within 15 minutes. Um, so we're gonna start your safari off right. Um, and you're gonna be in this lovely lodge um, lit, situated looking over um, a river into the park itself. Um, so the Emacoco has a lovely 10 bedroom lodge what I love about the properties that um, the Bush and Beyond Port, our members of the Bush and Beyond portfolio is they're all independently owned and operated. So the owners are there, they live there, they act as your hosts and your managers. And so this is Emma and Anton and their three kids. Imagine being a child growing up in the bush, um, amazing stories um, with wildlife as pets and, and things. And, and uh, so Emma and Anton will be there to greet you and, and we'll bring you into our uh, lovely little lodge area where you can have um, get yourself sort of organized and then we'll take you to your cottage room. So this is gonna be your room. And you, you can see there, we actually have a fireplace and that's because Nairobi sits at the same um, altitude as Denver. So it's at 6,000 feet um, above sea level. So it's cool in the, in the mornings and the evenings. So you'll come back at night with a nice crackling fire in your room. Um, and there's a nice swimming pool. Um, it's lovely. We often have dinners around there. And what we're going to start you with, and I'm going to show you this um, when, when you arrive, is our favorite cocktail. Because this is happening over a cocktail hour. So I thought I'd start you off with a cocktail. Um, and the cocktail of Kenya is called a dawa, and that is spelled D-A-W-A. And dawa means medicine in Swahili, which is the other language in Kenya, um, the national language with English. And a dawa is, I kind of call it a, a, the Kenyan version of a mojito. So it is made with honey, fresh lime, Kenyan limes, vodka, uh, ginger, and you muddle it all together um, and it makes this epic drink. And I have to say the Amacoco and their bartender, Patrick, makes the best. So we're just going to show you a little video. Hopefully you will hear the audio as well. Let me know if you're not hearing audio. No audio, okay. but I can hear. All right. I will fix that in a second. Let me see. It still looks really good. All right. 
Can you hear me? Okay. I'm going to pull yeah, my headphones out and that'll help with the video. So I'm um, going forward. Oh, so we'll switch in the dial. Um, one of the other great things, as I said, is because you're sitting right here in the Nairobi National Park, we can do a game drive. So we're going to have you arrive in the evening because most flights get in in the evening and, and we're going to give you a full day in Nairobi so you can get over a bit of your jet lag. Kenya sits um, for you will be 10 hours ahead, so you will have a bit of jet lag arriving. Um, so we'll have a nice full day, but that means we can get out and do a game drive. And one of the amazing things in Nairobi National Park is they have over 100 rhino um, in the park itself. Um, so I pretty well guarantee in your first day, you're going to get to see one of the big five. And we talk about the big five on safari and, and those come from the traditional old days of hunting, but know that in Kenya hunting has been banned since the 70s. Um, and the big five were sort of what were originally the big five trophy animals. So that was going to be your rhino, your lion, elephant, buffalo, and the leopard. Um, and you're going to find all but one of those in Nairobi National Park. Um, the elephant we don't have in Nairobi National Park. Um, and that's because, as I mentioned, we do have the city right on the other side. And elephants, despite fencing, like to go into people's gardens. And it, it makes a bit of a hassle for people in Nairobi. So we've moved the elephants out of Nairobi National Park. Um, but you will see everything else. And here's an amazing photo that I took actually of that one of the lionesses. And that is the city right there, um, uh, you know, in the background. Um, leopards, easy to uh, pretty easy to spot. They love where we are at the Amacoco. We have lots of beautiful trees and with the water there. And, and this is one of our famous leopards um, and her two cubs. Um, and this is kind of what it would feel like for you to be going out on a game drive um, on your first day there. We've done our first game drive. Oops, sorry, keeps always wanting to play the video a second time. No, <laughs> likes showing video. Um, one of the other things we can do is um, go over and visit. We have the Giraffe Center. Um, uh, so there's an opportunity to get up close and personal with a number of uh, giraffe species. This is actually the Rothschild giraffe. There are four different species of giraffe that you're going to find in Kenya. And, and the Rothschild are um, really mainly located in Lake Naivasha, but you can also come and meet them here at the Giraffe Center. And, and I love this photo because it shows you giraffes have blue tongues. Um, it's quite fun to see the, um, their tongues. And so you can go over and feed them. You can actually, if you're pre-COVID days or you're comfortable with it now, you can hold a pellet in your mouth and they'll come and give you a kiss, um, which is quite fun. Um, and the other thing we can go and visit is um, the Sheldrick Elephant Orphanage. So this is an elephant uh, orphanage where you can come in and meet the babes. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about a different uh, elephant sanctuary that you can have an even more fantastic experience at at the end of our safari. So um, we've had our two nights at the Amacoco and uh, we're going to move our way on and say goodbye. The, so this is going to be on our, our second morning. Um, in Kenya, we're going to, we'll get on a little plane, a little bush plane, and we will fly a 45 minute flight to the Maasai Mara in Kenya. Oh, yeah. the Maasai Mara is one of the natural wonders of the world. This is where the great migration takes place um, in July and August. Anybody who's seen that National Geographic have seen those epic shots of all the wildebeest coming down into the Mara River and the crocodiles um, trying to get them. Well, that's the Mara River right out front. So this actually, the Mara National Reserve crosses and becomes the Serengeti on the southern side in Tanzania. Um, and it is probably the premier safari destination on the continent and, and for sure in Kenya. Um, I, when I first took someone there, they said it felt like Jurassic Park because you just couldn't believe the vast um, 
wildlife um, just right there out front. So we're gonna stay at this amazing tented camp um, that's situated, as you can see, looking right out at the Mara River. And what's really fantastic about Tangley Amara Camp is we also have this salt lick right out front. And the animals, just like deers do, come to get salt for their diet. And they, in our case, it's gonna be elephants, zebra, giraffe. They all come here every sort of day to come and get um, their salt. So you always have wildlife out front. What I love about Tanglia and what makes it so special is this is the first Maasai owned and operated camp in the Maasai Mara. And so Maasai Mara is a place, it actually means the land of spotted hills, but Maasai is also the, the famous tribe of Kenya. There's two probably very quintessential tribes when people look at pictures and it's the Maasai who are the tall, slim gentlemen, you see them in the red shuka blankets and, and all of the the beads and then there's going to be the Sambru who are sort of the Maasai's cousins. They were once originally the same tribe and they're in the northern hemisphere. So in the southern hem hemisphere you're going to have the Maasai. And so this is amazing that the camp that's in the place of the Maasai is the first one ever owned by Maasai. Um, and uh, it's a beautiful situated tented camp. I always say you should always sleep under canvas at some point on safari. Um, here are the two Maasai gentlemen who own um, and run uh, Tangalia Mara Camp. Tangalia means to lead in the Ma language, so they're the first to lead. Um, this fellow here is Jackson Lucea. Um, Jackson is actually probably one of the most famous guides in Africa. Um, he's the host of BBC's Big Cat Diaries and Animal Planet's Big Cat Tales. Obviously he's a cat man. If there's anybody who knows where every lion, leopard or cheetah is on the Mara, that's gonna be Jackson for sure. Um, and then his best friend, they've been Dominic. He and Dominic Nico have known each other since they were eight years of age. Um, Dominic's a conservationist. He's established two private conservation areas, community conservation areas. And that's been one of the amazing things that's happened in Kenya. And that has been a model for the rest of Africa is this um, community conservation. And what I mean by that is the Maasai people are pastoralists. They have cattle, they're, they're cattle, goats, and sheep is really what they keep. And so they move with the grasses. That's where they need to be and they need to find gr grasslands. Well, of course, when you have them going in and taking out all the grass, that becomes a problem for the wildlife grazers. So things like antelopes and zebras and anything else that are gonna need, they're competing for the same grasslands. Um, and what the community conserv conservancies have done is basically said to the Maasai people, if you move your cattle over into this area and we do controlled grazing, so we move you in certain patterns at certain times a year in these thousands of acres, we will be able to have tourism come in here and as a result, because of the wildlife existing here, we are going to pay you a fee per bed night. So the communities benefit um, because they're actually earning income on tourism. And so they see the benefit of having the wildlife in their area um, as well. The wildlife benefits um, and we benefit by having much greater um, area because the biggest challenge that's happening anywhere from a wildlife perspective is human um, conflict. We're just taking wildlife land and that's happening as you know, all over the world. So um, it's been a great thing to see and it's definitely helped in the Mara. So this is gonna be your view out front of your tent, um, looking out there, um, those alleys crossing and, and the zebra at the salt lick. So again, you'll wake up in the morning and, and have wildlife just right out front, which is amazing. And when I say sleeping under tent canvas, um, on safari, we kind of don't do it like we would North American camping. This is glamping, let's all be honest. So you're gonna have a nice big bed, you're gonna have running water, you know, proper shower, flush loo. Um, you're going to have electric lighting. We can do mobile camping. That still exists and, and we do it at, um, as well. But this is kind of more what everybody's looking for. Um, so you have a lovely room and your coffee will get delivered in the morning. It's kind of the one thing that's lovely about being on safari is we'll find out the night before what time you'd like your wake up call and we'll come to your tent and set out for you on your front veranda, coffee or tea or juice, depending on what you want. And you're going to start your morning that way. Um, in the Mara, we really do focus in on game drives because we, we are really focusing on, on coming out to see the cats and, and they're something that we obviously want to be in a vehicle um, to see. Um, and uh, it's just an amazing, you know, I'm showing these photos and I want to let you know that the photos 
all the photos you're seeing um, are mine, um, and I am not a photographer. Um, as and if you want to go back and look at my Instagram feed, my last trip I just used my iPhone. Um, this previous this trip I just came back from. So these are not some of these are not with my iPhone. But my last trip I didn't even bring a camera. I just used my iPhone. So you do get very close to the wildlife comfortably, um, so that you're able to to do it um, and see it. And I always say the one cat I can't promise seeing is a leopard. And that isn't ironically because there's um, less of them. Uh, there, there are actually more leopards than there are cheetahs. Uh, the problem is with the leopard is they, they hunt at night and they are very, they like to, they're shy animals. They uh, do not like to find you. So um, this is an amazing story. This mama cheetah um, had, you can see here, six cubs uh, that she has raised to adulthood. I actually saw them in the fall um, and they had now split up. The three boys have all gone off together and the three girls are kind of, were staying with the mom at that time. Um, but the amazing thing now is I saw her again in January, the mom, and she has a new set of cubs. Um, so um, she's a very good, uh, healthy, good mama because she's raised six cubs and, and is on her next batch of litter. So um, cheetah population is very healthy. Um, I'm going to take you on a little game drive again because I think the videos tell you a little bit more about what it's going to feel like. Um, the other thing I love is, you know, we've talked about the game drives, but I think one of the things that's great that you can do because you sit in these sort of private areas and, and just to clarify for people, there's two types of um, area, wildlife areas in Kenya. So we have what are our national parks and, and national reserves and in there, obviously they're managed by the government. And there is requirements as far as what you can and cannot do within those uh, reserves or national parks. So you, you can't be in there before a certain hour. You have to be out by sunset. You need to stay on the roads. You can't get out of the vehicles. But when you get into these community conservation areas, because they are actually privately owned, they're owned by the local community, we can do some different things. And so one of the things I love to tell people to do is get out on foot. Um, and do this is kind of the traditional way, you know, safaris were originally done. If you think of out of Africa and, and Karen Blixen and, and Rupert Fintat, and they were out walking safaris, you know, with, with camp being carried that way. And so um, it's an amazing thing to get out on foot um, for a whole bunch of reasons, because you're, you're learning the art of tracking, which is always fun to see how do your guides know where the animals are. They're reading paw prints, they're, they're reading uh, for kids, it's great. It's it's birds and turds, you know. So you're you're learning about feces and how the different droppings show you what animal is there. Um, you're learning, you know, just a, all sorts of little things. You get to learn about the plant life, and you get to realize that this is a huge ecosystem. So you know, without certain grasses, without certain trees, without certain bugs, you know, the rest of the big game doesn't exist. And I think that's really important um, to do. Um, and then you have the art of the sundowner. It was funny, I ran into another two uh, guests staying at one of our, our camps when I was there in January. And we were talking about setting up for sundowners and they weren't drinkers. And they said, so what is a sundowner cocktail? And I'm like, no, 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 it's not a cocktail. It's being out and having a cocktail or a non-alcoholic beverage while the sun is setting. And, and we do this all over the place. So in this case, you know, because we were in private land, we set it up with a little fire, but we, you could do it as easily on the top of your Land Rover while you're watching the lions. Um, you know, it's just one of the things we do on safari and it's amazing because the sunsets, as you can see, and even Deb's background virtual screen are amazing in Africa. There's nothing like um, a sunset or a, 
uh, sunrise in Africa. But what I love about Kenya, and I think why I fell in love with it, um, wasn't about the wildlife. I mean, the wildlife is spectacular, but let's be honest, you can see lions in South Africa, you can see lions in Botswana. I think what makes Kenya so special and captured my soul are the people. Um, Kenya is home to over 52 different tribes. Each of those tribes still has their own in, 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 tribal language. Um, they still practice traditional tribal cultures. Um, and the two that do in the most way um, are the Maasai and the Samburu, who are the Samburu in the north and the Maasai in the south. And so one of the things we always get our guests to do, and because of our camps supporting the local communities or being wholly owned by the local communities, is to go and meet the communities, because I think that's what's going to make a difference. And I, I'm always amazed um, in both the Maasai and Samburu culture, it, you know, we talk about the warriors who are the men, um, and that's what the lore is. But let's be honest, it's the women who keep this, the, the keep the communities running um, without any doubt. Um, the women, you know, have, uh, have the children, the women look after, they build the homes when they move because they, again, are pastoralists. They, the women look after all of the smaller livestock. Um, the women manage all, manage all village um, disputes, um, all of that kind of stuff um, they do. And, and it's amazing to go and meet and chat with the mamas and, and have an opportunity to sort of see how they live their lives. And, um, and it definitely, you know, I always laugh. My, my husband had a, we did a camping safari, a mobile safari supported with camels. And Ian sat um, one night around the fire with our guide, Katanga, who's traditional Maasai. Um, and the two of them stayed up talking about what it is to be men raising men. And there's my husband who lives in a traditional Western world, is an engineer, you know, works in the corporate world. And there's Katanga, who technically you would think lives in a mud hut, you know, raises cattle, um, is not educated, you know, had a primary school education, but they had the same hopes and fears um, as fathers raising sons, uh, which I think was just an amazing thing. Um, and there is nothing like hearing the singing and the sounds and when, when the villagers welcome you. So that's the Mara. Um, so we've had a great three nights. I always recommend you want to do three nights there. There's lots to do and see and experience. And then we're going to get in our little bush plane and do another scheduled flight up. And we're going to cross the equator. Um, and we're going to go up to um, a, a place called Laikipia is the area. And we're going to go to the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy and, and stay at Lewa House. Um, so these are more cottage style. Um, we call them earth pods, actually, the way they've been designed. Um, and the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, it was established as a private conservancy back in the 1970s by a woman named Delia Craig. Um, Delia's grandfather or Delia's father was the first person to settle on what was known as Lewa Downs. It was his farm and that was over 100 years ago. So this conservancy has been part of the same family for over 100 years. Um, it's now owned by the Nature Conservancy, but um, the Craigs sold it um, or, or got the conservancy involved probably about 10 years ago now. And Lewa House is run by Sophie and Callum McFarlane. There's Sophie and her husband Callum. Sophie's Kenyan. She, it was her great grandfather who established Lewa. Um, and she's the fourth generation of her family to be involved on the conservancy. And then her, their two children are now the fifth generation. Um, Sophie went to school in Edinburgh and that's where she met Callum. She brought in a Scotsman uh, to, to come, but actually Callum's a safari guide. He was working in South Africa um, before. So they're there again, acting as the host managers. We're really comfortable having kids on safari. We love having them because we are raising our own kids there. But what I love about this is there's this amazing book um, uh, called From Oxcart to Email about Delia Craig. Delia Craig, Sophie's grandmother, arrived out there. Her, her dad was already out um, and she arrived out there with a shotgun and two pounds um, and she started trading cattle. She would go all the way up to the northern part of Kenya, Lake Turkana and buy cattle and she'd drive them down herself by oxcart to Nairobi and sell them. 
Um, the women in Kenya are badasses. Um, it's just so much fun to meet these really strong, dominant women. And, and Sophie is very much like her grandmother. Um, so amazing stories um, to hear about what it's like living and growing up um, in Kenya. What I love about the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy is you have these amazing views of Mount Kenya right there. We're right at the slopes of Mount Kenya. Um, and it's probably Kenya's second um, most dense wildlife destination. But because we've moved to the northern part of the northern hemisphere, um, our wildlife has changed. So um, there is in the southern hemisphere, you can have an ostrich that has what we all think of an ostrich of having pink legs and pink necks. When you get to the northern hemisphere, you have the smally ostrich. He ha they have blue necks and blue legs. Uh, in the south, you have the traditional giraffe um, with sort of a spotted pattern. When we get to the north, you have a reticulated giraffe, which is more of the pattern you see in fashion. So very clean lines on a reticulated giraffe. You have a different type of zebra. You have the rare endangered grevy zebra when you're here. We have different types of antelope. Um, so you get the chance to see um, different uh, wildlife species, which is great. But what makes Lewa so famous is its rhino population. This, as I said, was started as a private conservancy back in the 1970s, and that's the result of a woman named Anna Mertz, another amazing, strong woman. Um, Anna was actually an American who was very worried about what was happening to the rhino population. Rhinos are the most heavily poached animal in the world. Um, a rhino horn, one kilo of rhino horn, which is 2.2 pounds, is the most expensive commodity on the black market. It's about $50,000 US for a kilo of rhino horn. Each rhino has two horns. Each horn is about two and a half kilos. So each rhino on the black market, just their horns alone, are worth about $250,000 US. Um, and horns are fingernails. That's all they are. They grow back their, their keratin. There's nothing, or, nothing special to them, except for unfortunately in the Asian culture they are. So um, Anna Mertz realized rhinos were in trouble and she wanted to save them. And so she was looking for a place to relocate Southern white rhino. So white rhino, these rhinos you're seeing right here are not actually from Kenya. They're originally in Southern Africa, but they were being so heavily poached down there. She basically went around and asked anybody and Delia Craig and her husband Douglas raised their hands and said, yes, we'll take your Southern white rhino here. So Anna Mertz did this huge translocation project brought it, bringing up four white rhino um, to Lewa to coexist with the black rhino that we, we already have. Um, we're now the most successful rhino area in the continent. Um, we have over a hundred of each type of rhino, um, black and white rhino now here, to the point that actually um, we, we are repopulating the rest of the continent with our, with our rhino. So we're, we're really the, the saving point for rhino. Um, white rhino, so you know that first photo, white rhino, they have very big square jaws. That will tell you where their name comes from. White, they're called white rhinos not because of the color, they're not white. Uh, it's the Dutch word, the German word, weit, which means wide mouth. So they have a wide mouth, whereas a black rhino here that you're going to see has what we call a prehensile lip. So they have a little lip that crosses over um, on top. So that that's the big difference between the two of them. They're amazing species. The rhinos actually control their own population. When there's too many rhinos in a specific area, the mother rhinos stop giving birth to women, to females. They give birth to only males, so they can't continue. I mean, mother nature is amazing. Um, so here's a little video about one of my favorite animals, the rhino. Oh, let's see, there we go. Oh, let's try again, go back, let's see. I mm, maybe not wanting to play for you. Right. See if I go back and try one more time, and if not, there we go. So there's our black rhinos. That's a white. They weigh up to two and a half tons. They're amazing animals. 
Um, and then here's our Grevy zebras. Um, again, those are what you see. These guys here whose bottoms are facing us are what you're going to see when you're in the south. And then here are what you're going to see in the north, our grevies. Um, very different. You can see big white bellies, thinner stripes. There are only 3,000 of them left on the continent uh, of these grevies. They're highly endangered. And you're going to see 30% of the world's population on Lewa. So they're a great thing to see, um, as well as the rest of the wildlife. I mean, you, you know. You're just going to have a wonderful wildlife experiences. But again, because we're in a private conservancy, we can get out and do game walks. And then we can also go and visit this amazing place. And I did this on, on our trip just in January called the Ngari Ndari Forest. I describe it as Jurassic Park meets Avatar. Um, it's an amazing forest full of ebony trees and, and strangler figs. And it was what would have covered all the slopes of Mount Kenya. It's now a community conservation area. So the community itself runs this. And we have this great canopy walkway. So it allows you to get up and see the bird life here. There's parrots and colobus monkeys and different things. Uh, and then we have the famous blue pools. So anybody who's been or seen photos of Jasper um, in Lake Louise um, have seen these color of water, um, they're glacial. Um, and these are exactly that as well. These pools, there's a series of five of them, are filled from the waters that comes off Mount Kenya from underground springs. So I say it's a refreshing dip, um, but it's an amazing experience to be able to get in here, do this hike, and then refresh yourself in these amazing pools that you can jump into. This canopy walkway elephants actually can be underneath you while you're up top. Um, it's fantastic to be here. Clean, safe, the pools, there's nothing living in them, so it's great fun. And these waterfalls, you would think you were in Hawaii. I know everybody raised their hand about going to Hawaii, but. This definitely always feels like Hawaii to me. Um, and then, you know, the wonderful thing, and this is the thing that's been the biggest challenge with the downturn in tourism right now, is Lewa, for example, employs, as the Wildlife Conservancy, employs over a thousand people, um, be it staff at the, at the camps, be it our rangers looking after our rhinos, uh, be it the guys at the, managing the gates, preparing the roads, doing the fences, a thousand people. And in Kenya, it's average that every one employee in tourism directly is taking care of another 10. So that's 10,000 people that Lewa itself um, basically funds and, and pays. And tourism has dropped by 80% in Kenya. So um, that means you know that kids can't go to school because in Kenya, schools are, primary schools are free, but you still have to buy a uniform. So parents who can't afford to do that can't send their kids to school. And we're seeing this horrible trickle down effect um, that's happening from the lack of tourism. Um, right now, you know, obviously it's that that's happening. The next stage will be no question to me that our animals will be taken and they won't be taken for poaching reason. They'll be taken for bushmeat because people have to feed their families and they can't afford to buy food at the stores and you have an antelope going by, you're going to start taking that or a giraffe. Um, and that's the sad part of, of what's happening due to the pandemic. Um, but these guys are, are doing their darndest. They're amazing. They look terrifying, but they're great fun. Um, these are our rangers and our bloodhound tracking team. So um, they luckily don't spend a lot of time dealing with poachers. We haven't had that as a problem, but what they do do, which is amazing, is help the local community. So they, the bloodhound teams are, are used to help with any local um, burglaries, cattle rustling, anything like that, to the point that the community now, the reason why poaching has disappeared for us in Kenya overall is because the community recognizes the value of the rhinos and they're going to rat out any stray who's coming to town, who's trying to ask people for information about our rhinos. So um, it's been a wonderful thing to see how the community is getting involved. Um, so we've spent three nights at Lewa. We've done some great things with wildlife. We've gone to the schools. We've visited the headquarters, done some bloodhound tracking. We spent an amazing day in the Ngari Dari Forest. And now we're going to go further north and we're going to finish our safari up at an amazing place called Sarara which actually means the place of peace. Um, and this is in a conservancy called the Namunuk Conservancy, um, which is 850,000 acres. Uh, and we are the only tourism enterprises inside this conservancy. What's lovely about Sarara and the Namunuk Conservancy, it is wholly owned by the Samburo people. 
Um, so all of the monies coming out of this uh, for your con when you're coming to visit any of the camps here. So we have two properties here, the tree houses, speaking of tree houses, um, and our tented camp um, are going back into the local community. And the community itself decides what they're using those funds for, whether it's going to be for building new schools, putting in a well, um, you know, whatever. So it's, a, it's an amazing thing to see this ember of people actually get involved and they sit on the board and and, um, and they elect their board members and, and run it like a, a full corporation, um, which is great. Um, and so Sarai is also two of the board members and sort of the founding family for the Conservancy along with the Sembro are Jeremy and, and Katie and, and Jeremy's father was one, Piers, who started it. So Jeremy and Katie live here um, and uh, raise their children here as well. Um, and then act obviously as, as hosts and, and um, uh, guides and managers, but also with the Sambro staff. So we have Robert over at Sorara Main Camp and Philip at uh, Sorara Tree Houses, both Sambro and their full regalia and, and uh, great uh, people. So lovely tented camp. This is surrounded by this amazing ring of mountains called the Matthews Mountains. So it's a beautiful spot to be in and look at. Um, and this is home now to vast herds of elephants. Again, in the 1970s, there weren't an elephant to be found in this area. Um, the Somalis were coming down and, and taking out our Ellie's and, and it, because of community conservation has turned into this amazing uh, wildlife destination again. Again, we're in a community conservation area so we can get out and do some different things. So you can get out on horseback. Again, a great thing to be able to do because when you're on horses, any other four-legged animal like a giraffe or an antelope or a zebra sees you as another four-legged animal. So you can ride quite safely up to them. Obviously, we're keeping away from where lions are and we're always being careful of that kind of stuff, but lions don't want to see you. It's kind of, you know, like any of our predators, they really don't want to run into you. Um, but it's an amazing experience to do. This is actually my video, so it'll be a little less professional uh, than the earlier ones. This is from our trip just uh, recently. Oh, and let's see. Oh, I want to go back. Sorry. Joys of trying to run video. Let's see if it'll come back. Right there. My husband will tell you he only ever rides ponies as a kid on, at the zoo, never. And you can see how we can get right up to the draft. The fun part about Sarara with the draft is um, we have actually hand raised four different orphan drafts um, who have come. The community has found them. Their mothers have either died of natural deaths or, or have been um, in some cases taken uh, accidentally, you know, um, from a from a bushmeat perspective. Um, and so we've hand raised four of these giraffe who, um, as a result, have been grown up. Uh, I met Foofy actually back in 2016. He's now been released and he runs with the wild herds, but he still knows where home is and, and feels comfortable coming up to humans. So um, I had a great experience with me. I met Foofy, as I said, back in 2016. And when we were there just in January, Foofy came over to the la Land Cruiser when I was out and left up and greet him again, um, which was quite amazing. Um, and this is also where you'll find the singing wells. Um, I, I, one of the amazing things, and this is our last stop, so I'm almost finished. Um, our amazing thing about the singing wells is um, I use a watercolor because, as I mentioned, this camp and this area is owned by the local San Bluro, so we respect what is important to them and certain things they do not want to be photographed. Um, and the singing wells is one of them. And it's an amazing experience. As I mentioned, like the Maasai, the Samburu are pastor pastoralists. So they raise cattle, goats, sheep, camels. We're gonna find camels in the Northern part of Kenya. Um, and in the dry seasons, when the, the rains have left, um, the rivers can dry up completely up here. Uh, and so the Samburu dig wells down to the groundwater. And these wells have been in their family, the same well in the same area for generations. They go back to the same spot and we'll dig it back up. Um, and in the mornings, we'll go down with our guests. We usually walk down. We want to come in the same way the Samburu are coming in with their cattle and we'll bring them down. Um, so it's about a half hour, 45 minute walk out. Uh, and you'll come to this riverbed area where there's about 30 or 40 wells happening. Um, 
and uh, the men shook off their clothes and they form a human chain down to the bottom of the wells, which can be up to 100 feet deep. And they pass the buckets of water up to the troughs that are sitting on the riverbed. So they have wooden troughs that they put there. And they sing as they're doing this. Um, so it's a tune and it's calling. And when they're singing, they're actually calling their cattle, their goats, their sheep, so that they know to come to their well. So every single herder has a different song. So you have 30 or 40 different wells operating with different songs happening and the cattle and the sheep and the goats are all coming in. Um, and it's this amazing experience uh, to witness. But the other thing that's happening here is this is the meeting place. This is where everything happens. This is where marriages are arranged. This is where um, cattle are bought and sold from each other. This is where disputes, tribal disputes are settled. Um, and your guide being from the local Samburu people will actually walk you through the whole experience um, and usually helps um, with one of the wells. His cousin will be there. So he'll be helping him with the buckets and, and you get this amazing experience. Um, last couple of really interesting things to be able to do when you're at Savara that are fun. This amazing graffiti piece that's there. Um, this is a, a famous graffiti artist. He actually just finished an installation in Bentonville, Arkansas. He's kind of um, like uh, Banksy um, of that ilk. Uh, he came in, in in a day and this is Boris. Boris is a very famous elephant uh, here in the Namunet Conservancy. I, Boris came to the water hole in front of the pool while we were there. I'm a huge bull elephant uh, and uh, he in one day freehand scaffolding went up he spray painted Boris um, as a tribute uh, to the alleys and left so you can go and uh, go and see Boris when you're there. Um, one of the other great things we were talking about and you know uh, uh, Deb was mentioning about the women's beading projects and thing you can meet these mamas and, and do some bead work with them so this is me in January with these three ladies. Um, that's Agatha, Margaret, and Louise, um, and they had walked an hour in from their town, Tintel, um, to come and, and do bead work with me. So um, you pay them a nominal amount and, and you bring your items. So they beaded my hat and my fleece vest for me. And we sat and chatted. We have an interpreter that helps you have a conversation with them um, and was a great opportunity to be able to talk about their lives and, and my lives. Biggest thing we did was sing, though. Um, the women love to sing. Uh, and uh, so here they were t teaching me one of their songs. Um, which is great fun. They were, uh, we had a hilarious time together. Uh, and just really lovely ladies. Um, the other interesting thing for me that I didn't know was that the Samburu women like snuff. So they take tobacco, loose leaf tobacco and grind it up to a powder and, and we'll take snuff. And Agatha was saying she was getting a little late in the afternoon. So she took a little hit of snuff. I was like, wow, okay. Um, but this gives you sort of a view of what it looks like. And this is what I talk about the Samburu being different from the Maasai. The Samburu like hot pink instead of red. They're an amazing. They love to wear flowers. The Maranis wear plastic flowers and feathers in their hair and are just stunning. Um, but the last thing to just leave you with um, is the Reteti Elephant Orphanage that is here at Sarara. Again, this is a community owned project. Um, so the community, this is all local Samburu, are looking after their elephant orphans. And most of our elephant orphans that come here, we have 25 right now at Riteti. Um, we're really lucky it's not as a result of poaching. It's a result of these poor little guys falling into one of those singing wells and the herd not being able to, mama not being able to get him out or her out, the herd having to leave because it happens, you know, usually at, at twilight. Uh, and then, of course, the Samburu will come the next morning and find this Ellie baby in the bottom of their well, still okay. And so they'll call um, Teddy. We try to integrate them right away, but if that doesn't happen, we'll raise them back up. Um, and then we've, we'll, we'll release them back into the wild. We've done, Riteti is now four years old. We've done three successful releases to date. So um, it's just an amazing project. But what's really special about Riteti for me, and, and we're all women here on the call, is our keepers by and large are women. Um, and that has happened just innately. 
Um, these guys, these little Ellie's, when they come to us are dehydrated, as you can see, they're very, like all children, they've lost their mom, they're upset, they're concerned, and they, for some reason, have just naturally bonded with our female keepers. And so by and large now, we've just found that we have more women keepers um, because they need to be with their elephants until the elephant's about three years old, do we re-release them into the wild. So they're gonna have a three-year relationship with them. Um, this is Marion um, and one of our Ellie's. And, and what's been amazing as well though is what this has meant for women in the Samburu culture. Um, women by and large just stayed at home. They weren't educated, um, you know, and now we're having a generation of women that are seeing young women in their 20s and 30s have successful careers um, and be role models. And so the next generation of Samburu girls are wanting to go to school and their fathers are thinking it might be a good idea because they can see that they, they could earn an income. Um, and they have role models, um, successful, amazing women role models that they, they are now um, seeing as, as something they can aspire to be. Um, so it's been a wonderful uh, thing for both the elephants, because our elephants are surviving and thriving, um, but it's had a, an amazing sort of adjunct um, a thing with, um, for the women in the community and, and what it means for them. Um, I'm going to leave you with one last video. It's a, this one's a bit longer. It'll just give you an overall feel and, uh, and then we'll uh, wrap up for questions. Africa is mystic. It is wild. It is a hunter's Valhalla. It is the last vestige of a dead world or the cradle of a shiny new one. It is what you will and it withstands all interpretations. To a lot of people, it is just home. So thank you. I'm sorry. I, I went on. I can talk about it for ages. So. <laughs> Liz, thank you so much. That was amazing. Oh, hold on one second. I just got to switch many my of your presentations, oh, and um, every time I just want to book a ticket mm -hmm. and go to Kenya. <laughs> <laughs>